Okay. Sorry, one second. I've confused myself with the technology. Right, good. Um, so welcome to uh, this meeting of the Global HLP AOR. Um, very good to, to see you here. And um, yeah, we'll keep um, letting people in if they're if they're in the lobby. Um, I'm going to record the call because I know some people aren't available who wanted to be here. Um, we tend to record most of the calls, so um, so you can catch up on that, um, and we'll be doing that. And I'll just quickly share my screen so you can see the agenda for today. Um, we're currently in the uh, the welcome and intro section. Um, and then, yeah, we're going to have an update from the HLP AOR side. So we have a, a few things to update you on. Um, we have um, some information just around up, upcoming events. We're going to hear from Trezor, who's going to give us an update on the work he's been doing on information management and use of data. Um, and also hear a little bit more about some of the other things that are coming up in the next few months. Then I'm just back from a brief visit to Ukraine, so I thought I'd share just some brief reflections on that visit. Um, and I see Stuart here as well, who's the HLP Technical Working Group coordinator there, who not only was very helpful in the visit, but also can offer some some reflections too. Um, we also have an update from our colleagues from the Shelter Cluster, who are working on a, a, an HLP for Shelter toolkit, and maybe also have an update on the uh, shelter and uh, land due diligence um, revision that's that's going on and then um, for me often the best part is to hear from you so to hear brief updates from either your you know if you're working in operations how are things there what's going on maybe there's um, some specific uh, resources that you want to discuss and share or just a, a particular thing that's that's going on in your context where you're working so to hear updates from you would be great um, and then if there's any other business um, we will we'll finish from there so um so that's what we're we're uh, looking at doing today and i'm going to start with the yeah brief update from the aor side and then to do that we're going to um, move to Trezor, who's going to speak to us um, about the work he's been doing on the information management and data uh, side for the last few months um, and give us um, yeah, a sense of, of how that's developing and, and what's going on. So Trezor, over to you. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, hi to everyone. Um, let me know if you, you can see my screen. Yeah, we see it well. OK, uh, thank you. So here, uh, so this is the, an, an update uh, on deformation ma management. So I will start first by the, the dashboard. So it is still uh, the draft, but the idea behind uh, the development of this dashboard was to get uh, an overview of of what is happening uh, um, about the, the HLP. And um, it, it is important to note that uh, deformation was gathered from from different uh, humanitarian uh, response plan. And uh, this information include uh, the people in need, uh, the people targeted, and also the funding uh, requirement uh, for for the the HLP. And, uh, and uh, apart from that also, uh, we have uh, some missing uh, information. And this information uh, is about, for, for example, the, the people reached uh, by by DHLP uh, assistance, and also uh, the number of of partners are uh, providing uh, HLP assistance, and probably uh, uh, these two information we will reach out uh, to to you to partners uh, uh, next year to co start collecting uh, the information about how many people have been reached by DHLP uh, through the 2023 uh, year. And uh, in addition to that, you, you can also see that we have uh, some information about the, fu the fund uh, received uh, for the HLP. And it's important to note that uh, 
defining data are, are remain a big challenge and not only for the HLP, but also for, for the other uh, clusters. And this is because uh, HLP expects most of, of, uh, of the clusters uh, to use uh, the financial uh, tracking system, the FTS, uh, so when communicating about the, the funding uh, status. So OCHA uh, used to expect uh, most of clusters to use the, the FTS, but unfortunately, uh, the, F, the FTS does not uh, necessarily uh, provide the updated uh, information. And also when it is about, for example, uh, a project that relates to the protection cluster, it is not possible to know how much uh, amount was allocated exactly for different uh, AOR. So this was not a good option uh, for us to get a sense of uh, how many uh, funding have been uh, given to the to the HLP. And the, as the alternative, uh, the Global Protection Cluster has undertaken the funding data collection exercise. And um, this data is collected directly from partner of national uh, protection cluster um, around uh, different uh, information. And uh, yeah, although the GPC uh, data can also have some limitation, but for us, it was the only option that uh, we could use in order to get the information about the funding on the on the uh, HLP. So the second point uh, that I would like also to discuss is about the uh, HLP indicators being used to monitor the 23, 2023 humanitarian uh, response. So when, uh, for example, uh, we'll start collecting uh, the number of, of the people reached by HLP uh, assistance, it's important to, to be aware that uh, different country uh, use different indicator to monitor their HLP uh, response. And actually, um, indicators are not uh, formulated the, the same way. So what we have done, we should try first uh, to group some indicators of, uh, based on their uh, on the similarity in their uh, for formulation, and this uh, gave us uh, seven indicators uh, that you, you 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 can see here. So some relate to the dispute uh, dispute resolution, other relate to a number of persons provided with HLP uh, legal assistance, and and so on. So the third uh, point is about the the website, uh, the HLP web, uh, website. As you all know, uh, the HLP does not have um, a standalone uh, website. So we have uh, a web page uh, hosted under the Global Protection Cluster website. And this year, we will continue updating uh, the HLP uh, web pages uh, hosted under the GPC website. And um, Guidance, uh, meeting, recording, uh, training are, are available uh, to this uh, web page. So, in my right, you can see the blueprint because a few, few months ago we have started a discussion about thinking uh, how we would like our future website uh, to look like. And this it is, it is only a blueprint. So, uh, discussions on the development of the new HLP website will start. Uh, next year, but we'll start first by uh, by turning around uh, this blueprint uh, before uh, starting the the development. And um, yeah, so about the humanitarian uh, planning cycle, I think that you may notice that uh, actually in different uh, operations, so this, uh, these are uh, difficult uh, situation because uh, most of the countries are in the process of uh, humanitarian uh, planning cycles. So I have started uh, discussions with some countries, uh, especially uh, the country from the West and Central uh, African region. And this included Burkina Faso, Cameroon, uh, Mali, uh, DRC, and Niger. And uh, the discussion was about uh, just to get in, an idea of how the process is, is, is going on. And also if uh, there are any area of support where um, the HLP uh, could, could support. And most of requests that we are receiving, uh, they relate to the methodology uh, in, in estimating the people in need and also uh, the methodology in estimating the 
HLP uh, severity of of need. And also some requests also relate to the uh, costing methodology uh, of HLP uh, during uh, this HPC uh, process. And also, um, um, and also are asking about the HLP uh, indicators uh, that was considered uh, for HF, uh, for HF uh, 2.0. And uh, for those maybe who may not be uh, familiar to, to CHAF, uh, so CHAF is the global uh, standard for the estimation and analysis of humanitarian needs and, and protection risk. I think that uh, in most of, of countries, uh, OCHA is conducting uh, different uh, JAF uh, training and also the global, uh, the global protection cluster also organized the JAF 2.0 uh, webinar uh, in the last uh, August. And my last point is about the IM uh, dedicated uh, country support. So uh, last month I've been supporting uh, the Mali HJP working group in putting in place uh, a dashboard uh, that will help them to monitor uh, their uh, 2023 uh, HLP response. But the idea behind this is to adapt the same dashboard for, for other uh, countries as well uh, if, if they have the similar uh, need. And uh, thank you. That's all for me. Thanks, Trezor. Thank you for that update. So, um, yeah, some of you may have questions on 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 what Trezor's presented, um, specifically around uh, some of the the tools that he's developing. Um, I just wanted to say quickly um, that. And part of Trezor's role has been to support the uh, operational country colleagues um, to start to um, develop further their way they are able to manage the information and share information and gather data around their operations. So it has a very um, applied um, focus on, on operations. Um, but part of the reason we want to draw together some of this information to make it available um, on the website is to allow us all to have a better understanding of where HLP features in some of the humanitarian operations. So sometimes there are dedicated HLP projects and components in other um, other responses we're trying to sort of see HLP integrated in the work that others are doing as well. So it's to try and build up a picture and, and we're really keen to hear suggestions from you as well about what sort of information management products would be helpful and useful. Um, and yeah, so this is sort of part of a, a ongoing ongoing work that Trezor's uh, doing. Uh, but yeah, just want to open up for any questions around this um, sort of specific area. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, see if anyone has any questions. Feel free to either raise your hand or you know come in or write something in the chat. And if you would like to ask your question in French, um, that would be fine as well. And uh, so do let us know. Yes, Anne-Sophie, please come in. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening from Bangkok. Uh, I'm one of the, the teams of thematic experts with the GG Echo, just in case people don't know me. Uh, thank you very much for this update and uh, very welcome the the attempts both in terms of measuring the funding. I think we all recognize that the FTS is definitely not uh, working as it should be. Uh, so so very welcome that that you're trying to to do otherwise. Also very welcome on the uh, the attempt to sort of try and and group indicators and and have sort of a bit of a standardization on the indicator. Uh, one question though that springs to mind with the ones you've grouped, they're very much at output level, right? So I just wonder, are you also looking at outcome level and trying to look at HLP outcome indicators, which would be different than the number of people who have been reached with various kinds of services uh, and so on? Yeah. Over. Yeah, uh, thank you very much uh, for the question. So uh, most of these uh, indicators, so we took them uh, first from, from the uh, humanitarian uh, response plan. And the idea, uh, and the first idea was first to have an idea because from one country to another, the indicator are not uh, formulated uh, the, the same way. 
And when, for example, we plan to collect the number of people uh, who have been reached by HLP next year, it's important uh, for us uh, first to define uh, what do we mean by by the people uh, reached by by the HLP uh, assistance? And I'm sure that uh, I will have uh, bilateral uh, discussions from different uh, countries to maybe to to agree with, with them. Uh, is there may, maybe any indicator that can be collected uh, twice for, uh, from the same person? How to avoid uh, duplication uh, counting? And as I've been supporting uh, 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 the HLP working group in, in Mali, I see um, a big uh, opportunity of the way uh, we could uh, try to uh, to define the number of, of people uh, being reached. But I agree with, with you that, uh, that first uh, is about getting the number of, of people reached, but I'm sure that we can also start uh, at the discussion about how do we see it also. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Trezor. I mean, that's a great question, and and, and, and um, uh, yeah, it gets to the kind of heart of a lot of the discussions around, um, you know, information, data, what are we trying to find out? And it's, uh, so yeah, as Trezor says, he, you know, he's doing the work to try and align the kind of the sector and the response and these kind of things. But I think, you know, those bigger questions are something that myself and, and Ombretta, the coordinator, um, co-coordinator with, with View and Habitat as well, have started discussing, like, how do we really um, understand what are the key outcomes that we would look for and how do we look at trying to measure them and then how do we make sure our programming fits that and it might be something that we could have a, a call with you about at some point because it would be great to get your perspective on on that and and others as well who, who would be keen um so yeah and and uh, on Bretta, i see your hands raised I, I imagine you have something to say on this yeah, thanks, Jim, uh, and uh, thanks, Trevor, for all this work. I mean, which is really um, a great, uh, you know, point where we can look what's there uh, and, and how to improve it. Um, I would like also, I mean, uh, it's not an easy work at all. And um, I mean, not besides the collection, but actually for the people in the field to, to actually track down uh, the needs and and uh, even the deliverable at the output level um, and then of course to make the jump at the outcome level is another step. To complement this um, at UN Habitat we are actually doing um, complementary uh, work which is collecting the land and housing indicators um, that are used maybe more by um, by the humanitarian partners, but also by development partners to monitor land tenure security in crisis setting. So these would be the indicators that tend to be, uh, in terms of formulation, more at the outcome level <laughs> that that development partners use. But there we see another challenge on the other side that okay, while their tracking is more formulated at the outcome level. There is there are really gaps in in the methodology of data collection and in in the capacity of development partners to actually cover adequately the population that is affected by crisis and then how to to uh, to juggle these basically different needs. So this is just to say, I mean, supporting what Jim said, uh, is we are really trying to we are at the HLPOR to try to recollect a little bit all the, the these different bits and pieces of processes. And we are very much aware that I think there is a lot of work to consolidate um, HLP indicators globally, both from the protection cluster level, from the shelter cluster aspects and other actors working on HLP um, in different kind of coordination uh, platforms. Thanks, Jim, over to you. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it feels quite an exciting opportunity, really, to actually understand what we're trying to do and also to make sure we yeah draw from what the work of the shelter cccm and other colleagues are doing and try to do that with a view to solutions and uh, thinking longer term as well which i think is yeah is a challenge but you know it's part of the reason why it's it's so great having you in habitat like involved as well because we have that that dual perspective from the the humanitarian through so yeah 
let's um, be great to keep that conversation going. And um, yeah, if others are interested in joining that as well, I mean, we'll, if we develop that, we'll we'll think of a way to invite people. But do um, either put something in the chat or drop us an email um, around that. And similarly, discussions around yeah, so indicators, but also as we're developing the website, and uh, we want to make sure that is useful and and does what it needs to do for the housing, land, and property community. So um, yeah, it would be great to have you involved. So do let us know if you would like to be. Um, otherwise, we will be um, yeah pursuing you to uh, request your assistance as well. Um, but yeah, that would be great. So. Um, and just to say, so Trezor mentioned his work supporting colleagues in Mali. Um, and, you know, that's part of his role is to offer that support to colleagues. So if you are um, yeah, in need of some advice or, or maybe some uh, work on tools and things, do do let us know. And, and uh, Trezor, uh, yeah, will be able to um, support uh, as well. Um, and just to mention quickly as well, for our coordinators, those that are involved in HLP coordination, we will have um, the next sort of check in uh, catch up on uh, November the 14th. And um, so it'll be good to hear how things are. And uh, yeah, and I know it's HLP season. So please, if there's anything we can support with, do let us know. Um, OK, great. And thanks. And any more questions that come for Trezor, you can ask at the end as well or drop them in the chat um, and we'll make sure he he gets them and can and can respond. I'm um, just going to share about another um, event that's coming up. So you probably received an email from me. Um, well, and on Bretta um, about the um, Global Protection Forum, and um, that's something coming up at the end of the month. And we're fortunate to have um, a session um, dedicated to um, HLP, which is on the 25th of uh, October. And it's going to be looking at HLP rights as proactive protection, but thinking about custom, climate and community. So um, looking particularly about how colleagues work in contexts where there are uh, you know, customary uh, ways of organising land rights and access to land and, and what does that mean for us working in those contexts uh, and some of the particular things that come up there. It's something that a lot of people are raising. Um, so, yeah, it'd be great to get together and discuss that. But there are other events as well that you might like to to register for. I'm just going to drop the links in the chat um, so you can find out more information and um, sign up as well. I don't know why that's doing that anyway. Um, but yes, do have a look at that. That'd be great to, to see you there. Um, OK, now I'm going to turn to Laura Cunial. I think you're online, who is going to give us um, a brief update on something that, um, yeah, for, for HLP colleagues could be quite interesting. So the Global Refugee Forum coming up at the end of the year um, is an opportunity to make pledges and sort of bring together different actors around specific things. And um, UNHCR are leading on this and as part of the working group we have NRC and UN Habitat um, and potentially others to get involved as well um, to develop a, a pledge around uh, housing, land and property. So Laura is going to give us an update on that and uh, yeah, give us some clues as to how to get more involved. Uh, Laura, over Thank to you. you. Thank you, Jim. Can you confirm you're hearing me? Perfect. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Greetings from Uganda, Kampala. So my connection is not wonderful today, but uh, I hope we will all uh, for the rest of the call. Um, so yes, uh, a quick update on the um, Global Refugee Forum, which is scheduled uh, in mid-December in uh, Geneva. And this is part, of course, of the work being led by UNICR, as you said, Jim, on the uh, Global um, uh, Compact for Refugee. Um, the previous Global Refugee Forum, uh, which was scheduled in 2019, uh, didn't really see much coverage uh, when it comes to housing, land and property rights. And in fact, uh, the pledges, they really directly or indirectly uh, looked at HLP were uh, quite limited uh, in number and also in terms of commitment. So there is an opportunity um, this time to really raise awareness but really ensure that HLP is more present in the uh, Global Refugee Forum through uh, you know, an increase in number of uh, pledges and commitment. 
Um, so, um, as you said, Jean, there is a working group uh, right now uh, uh, being led by uh, UNHCR uh, and supported by uh, UN Habitat and NRC. And the plan is to uh, develop a multi-stakeholder um, pledge uh, to secure housing, land and property rights. Um, the idea really is to uh, uh, put HLP uh, in the agenda uh, through this pledge, but also uh, some side event that will be taking place during the uh, forum itself and ensure uh, increased visibility and commitment uh, on HLP. Um, we currently have a draft pledge um, and the idea of the pledge really is to cover uh, quite many areas of work uh, given the cross-cutting nature of HLP and also uh, the fact that uh, the hope is really for different type of entities uh, to uh, make pledges. And the current draft covers issues related to uh, restitution and compensation of HLP for refugee um, upon uh, return uh, or uh, in, in transitional justice process. Uh, but also uh, another area which comes out strongly is documentation of HLP to increase tenure security other strategy really to increase uh, HLP rights and also material support and technical support that can be provided on a HLP issue. Um, the draft also has quite clear instruction on how to pledge uh, and how to really join um, this uh, pledging through uh, different actors. So a pledge can be made by a country of origins, country that are hosting the refugee, uh, as well as donor states, um, intergovernmental bodies, INGO, NGO, but also development cooperation, development actors, and refugee-led organization. Um, the pledge, as I said, uh, is on draft stage, but we are hoping uh, that it will be available online uh, in the upcoming week, and there is a meeting already scheduled for the 12th of October at 2 p.m. Uh, Geneva time. So uh, for those of you who are on the call today and your interest, there will be a great opportunity uh, to hear more about the pledge and also to learn how uh, pledges can be made. Uh, so perhaps um, those of you who are interested can put their name uh, on the chat and then uh, we will be uh, following up on the 12th. Uh, that's all from my side. Jim, uh, back and over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, please do let us know if you'd like to be part of those um, those discussions. And um, yeah, it's an opportunity also to you know push HLP beyond the the regular uh, people who um, who are involved, and uh, yeah, try and get more of a sort of collaborative consensus uh, around HLP beyond uh, our sort of humanitarian response community as well. So yeah, thanks, Laura, for the update. Um, and yeah, that's great. So again, any questions around that, do please let us know. Um, raise your hand or in the chat. And uh, yeah, I'm going to hand now to Ombretta, who is, oh, sorry, hang on, I just saw a hand. Barbara, yes, please come in. Hi, thank you, uh, Laura, for the, for the brief. I, I wanted to ask, what was the... Um, I mean, on which basis were this, the different themes you mentioned? Uh, on which basis were they identified? Is it just something that you in HR? Because, um, you know, they talk a lot in the GRF about consultation with refugees, um, you know, checking with the field. Is it the result of a, a process of that kind or...? Yes, thank you, Barbara. Is the result of a process of that kind, and UNICR, as we understand, led uh, quite extensive internal uh, um, consultation and external consultation through the different regional bureau. And then I think um, the, some of the drafting is coming from UNICR, from the Division of Solutions. So there is that solution lens uh, in, in some of the language. Um, but however, I would say that um, some areas are very broad and very general, so uh, it also offers opportunity for then uh, the different agency 
uh, or donors or government who are interested to make a pledge to go into more details uh, and use the language uh, as, as an anchor, as an entry point. Um, it covers country of origin as well as country of displacement. Uh, so uh, again, the language is uh, quite broad. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Barbara. Um, yes, yeah, so I look forward to discussing that more in the coming weeks and uh, yeah, having your involvement. Um, great. Um, Ombretta, over to you. Thanks, Tim. Um, and then, I mean, just to add to this uh, pledge, um, I mean, this is a global multi stakeholder mega pledge. Uh, but it's also meant to open the door uh, for different stakeholders to come and maybe state and, you know, uh, define in a bit more local manner their own particular interests and needs, you know. So it's a, it's a sort of a, uh, it opens the door for partners to actually demonstrate their needs, their interests, uh, and then, uh, you know, a further definition of actually the activities to be carried out, obviously, within those big, bigger, broader scope can take place then for the specific local levels. Um, yeah, so so great to see that there is some interest in joining that and we look forward to have more partners into that uh, process. Uh, from my side, I just wanted to give you updates. As you know, uh, when you and joined um, the AOR, the idea was that we bring in a little bit the, the development actors perspective. So uh, one of the, um, the objectives that we set for ourselves and also reflected in the OR work plan is to bring in the uh, HLP uh, uh, perspective and framing into processes that are more um, that are led generally by development actors. So uh, in this uh, sense, I want to flag that there are two international conferences coming up that might be of interest of the people in this group. Uh, and uh, we are uh, attempting to actually um, create in these two conferences a space where HLP actors, more humanitarian actors, can have a role in presenting their, their views and needs in, in relation to the theme of the conference. So the first one, uh, and, and they are both in May, actually next year. Uh, one is the, um, International the International Federation of Surveyors Conference, which will take place in Accra from the 19th to 24th May. Um, and these are basically the surveyors, those people will actually be <laughs> supporting from the local level the the protection of HLP rights and also setting in place systems that will stay in the country to protect the housing and land rights of the people. Uh, so we are trying to secure a couple of sessions, one on women land rights and one on the role of surveyors in crisis. Um, and we'll definitely share more information with you. By the way, that uh, I'll set. I'll also put the link in the in the chat. But uh, the call for papers is open. Um, so uh, if any of you is interested to to actually, you know, present your work there, please please do apply there. It's really uh, big in terms of uh, you know uh, scope. It's a big conference and is a good platform definitely for HLP actors to get to know a little bit more the um, the land pro professionals on that side. Uh, the other one is the World Bank Land and Poverty Conference. I'm sure more many of you are familiar with. As soon as we get also more information on how we can better integrate the crisis perspective, uh, we'll discuss with Jim uh, as well and colleagues how to do so, and we'll try to secure a, a, a session there at least. Um, plus, of course, there will be technical sessions that are for crisis. So again, there will be possibility of submitting papers. Um, also briefly, uh, you know, we are uh, developing with partners uh, um, at UN Habitat uh, land sector profiles for countries. Uh, which actually describe the country land sector uh, beyond HLP, but including HLP. And we just published online uh, the one for Yemen. Uh, I'll put the link as well in the, in the chat. Uh, and we are finalizing Libya. So it will be, I think, interested for, for those of you who work in that area to have a look 
um, and see you know a different dimension of the HLP spectrum that maybe could complement or uh, uh, add a lens to, to the work you are doing. Um, and with that, I think Jim, uh, thanks, and over to you. Thank you, um, Ambretta. And um, yes, there's a question just to confirming the date of the FIG conference. I believe it's May next year, but just want to double check that. Um, but yeah, thanks for that. Um, uh, great. And uh, if people have um, resources, events they want to share, um, please do um, yeah, post them in the chat or come in and 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 share about those uh, at the end when we come to that section. Um, it'd be great to to know what's what's going on. Um, uh, so so yeah, we that would be we would like to to hear about those. Um, and yeah, always check on you know for example on the HLP AOR web pages. Um, you know, there's still the the relatively recent training there. Um, there's been some new new publications produced as well around the HLP and climate that links to previous uh, events that we've done as well. So, um, so yeah, we'll um, we look forward to to hearing uh, about about those. I see a hand raised. Yeah, Clementine, would you like to come in? I don't know if you had a question or a comment, but please go ahead. No, James, it's just to app share the update of Niger in uh, the chat. They can, I can um, spoke about it. Uh, the, we found that there is many uh, IDPs installed on spontaneous seat, sometimes with only a verbal authorization or without any authorization of all. So analysis and analysis and study was carried out for the situation of this out of one uh, 148 seats in the region of Tilaberi, Maradi and Tawa, and we found that 74 percent was installed with verbal authorization, 19 percent without authorization with risk of forced eviction. And this could be worsened with the military operation follow up in the current situation in Niger now. Then uh, the report is on progress, but the result was already present in the humanitarian country team and in ICCG for uh, advocacy to authority to see how can be done. And uh, we also draw the L, uh, housing land and property right referencing monitoring document um, in in the different housing zones. So now we have an reference document with on Tilaberi, Maradi, Tawa, all the zones impacted by the conflict. And this has been shared to humanitarian community to be used. Thank you. Thank you, Clementine. So yeah, what I'm hearing there is, yeah, a, a real vulnerability and uh, a risk of eviction for a, a lot of people, a lot of people there on the num over 140 sites. Um, thank you and thanks for that update. And thanks for pasting it in the chat as well for others who would like to have a look. Um, and yeah, let's follow up on that as well and see how how best we can support and, and see if there's anything that we can uh, discuss further. Thank you, Clementine. And others who would like to um, share updates, yeah, please, we will we will come to that um, in a in a few moments as well. So yeah, thank you, Clementine. Um, I'm just going to share very briefly um, about. Um, uh, a recent uh, visit I made to Ukraine last week. I only got back a few days ago, so this is is, is only very fresh, but wanted to just share some initial reflections. I, I was there as part of the Global Protection Cluster um, mission there, so I was representing the AOR on behalf of uh, Ombretta as well, and, um, and, and we travelled with the coordinator of the Global Protection Cluster and also the coordinators of the Mine Action child protection and uh, GBV areas of responsibility. So this is the second time we've done a kind of a joint visit. Uh, we went to Somalia in March this year, and, and it's to try and bring the whole protection uh, cluster community together um, and see where there are opportunities to uh, work more closely and collaborate, but also to try and understand from the global level where we can better support or advocate for things, try and understand more of what's happening and, and uh, some of the dynamics uh, between various uh, colleagues working on these issues. Uh, and in Ukraine, you know, it's a particularly um, 
interesting context because you've got a very strong uh, state uh, and national organizations and strong civil society as well. So it, it raises lots of really uh, good and vital questions about how how the humanitarian uh, sector works and how we engage properly with those partners. Um, I just wanted to share um, a, a couple of pictures just to give a bit of a, a flavour because it just of, of some of the things we did. So, you know, we met with um, we had quite a few meetings to try and understand the different dynamics. So we met with the, the cluster lead agencies, as well as our, our colleagues in the different area of responsibilities, um, and also with other groups like this is with the, uh, the National Association for People with Disabilities to understand more how they were being affected and whether or not they were um, yeah, able to access and influence the response and, and things that, that were happening. Um, we met with donors, with the humanitarian country team, um, with OHCHR and the NGO platform, again, to try and understand some of the different things at play in a context where you know there's quite a lot of focus and interest um, and a lot of funding as well. And just what does that mean? Like it shows what's possible, but it also raises some different questions as well. Um, then I had the pleasure and privilege to join um, with Stuart and uh, we went out to visit uh, some of the work being done by um, NRC as part of their, their shelter response. And so this was the shelter team and working with the ICLA team on sort of due diligence to uh, help start repairing some of the housing that had been damaged by shells or missiles and that kind of thing. Um, and with Stuart, we're able to also meet with Shelter Cluster, CCCM. We met UN Habitat colleagues there, also DRC. Um, thank you, Barbara, for those introductions. And I was able to join the HLP Technical Working Group uh, meeting there, which um, is a very vibrant, dynamic community. There's, you know, there's over 60 on the call from, you know, UN agencies, clusters, NGOs, INGOs, World Bank, embassies, private sector, all sorts there, and a really strong Ukrainian presence as well. So it had that very, sort of very well connected to uh, to what's going on and to um, the different groups and, and dynamics um, there. Um, and we also saw, you know, some people are responding to their shelter needs with, you know, their own repairs. Um, another example we saw there on the left, that it's a bad photo, so I apologise. But um, you can see the top of a, a sort of a modular house that had been um, used as part of a way to provide some kind of temporary accommodation for people as well. So there were there were various ways in which people were um, were responding. And and the wider context of of what's going on there is that um, you know there's as we know from these meetings and uh, uh, and presentations over the last you know, two years really uh, there's there's a a push to uh, develop you know compensation laws to think about how to um, you know rebuild infrastructure how to take that longer term role but as well as the immediate shelter needs and particularly with winter coming that can be very cold indeed um, a real um, yeah, urgency to, to respond. So um, I think some of the brief reflections from spending uh, you know, five days there, so I'm not claiming any specialist insight at all, but um, but one thing that did come up was this, the dynamic between the you know, humanitarian actors wanting to advocate for principled humanitarian space, uh, trying to maintain that focus on protection and the most vulnerable and those risks, and, and that happening at the same time as a very sort of, um, yeah, well resourced um, uh, response that's looking at kind of more transition and development and longer term uh, uh, rebuilding and infrastructure and and just you know within the the humanitarian community trying to understand what role they might have in that, um, but also how to make sure we maintain that focus on those that are most at risk and most vulnerable in amongst such a um, a, a wide spread uh, rebuilding effort. So. Um, yeah, there were clear needs between, you know, clear links between sort of housing and, and sort of questions around social cohesion. What's going to happen with um, the non-government controlled areas? If that changes, how are people going to move and how will people be prioritised for compensation? Um, so there's some unknown issues and um, yeah, all in the context of a very strong you know, sort of state presence and uh, very fast moving sort of legal landscape as well. So it was um, yeah very interesting and probably we'll have some more uh, reflections in due course. But just wanted to share that brief update and also to invite Stuart to um, yeah offer any comments from from his side just on not not particularly on the visit, but just in terms of how you see HLP in Ukraine at the, at the moment. 
Yeah, thanks, Jim. Um, and it was a pleasure hosting Jim and uh, um, and the colleagues from the Global Protection Cluster. Jim's Jim's an easy uh, easy person to host. So if uh, if he is coming to uh, to a location near you, uh, definitely mm -hmm. thumbs up for uh, you know for your engagement. But uh, but also you know just a lot of the a lot of times you know I I tend to get sort of focused on what I'm focused on, and um, you know, and those are sort of the, the issues of the day and the problems of the day. And so it was actually very helpful when you came and we had, you know, uh, several meetings with this larger group, but then you and I had um, a lot of bilateral meetings with um, with our kind of uh, important partners in the HLP technical working group, but also, you know, the protection uh, cluster coordination team, the shelter cluster coordination team um, to, you know, kind of, uh, you know, look look at these sort of like trends that are happening in terms of sort of the humanitarian space, and uh, because you know I, I I'm working on these things, but sort of positioning the housing land and property technical working group for, um, you know, for contribution to the durable solutions discussions uh, and how to do that, and and uh, you know, and, and sort of what. Um, you know what additional things uh, could be a part of the you know the activities that the HLP technical working group is doing uh, was an important you know conversation to have because you know these are not you know these are these are not conversations that happen so frequently you know in this you know the space I'm in we're usually kind of talking about operational uh, operational things and so that was uh, that was quite helpful it was it was also just a, a great you know opportunity to see you know some of the some of the due diligence activities and really get an under, a better understanding, you know, and uh, of what, uh, yeah, what it looks, what the, you know, it looks like on the ground in terms of HLP, you know, concerns. I mean, we, uh, um, you know, I'm often here in uh, Kiev, uh, you know, and get out a little bit, but, uh, but that was, you know, not too far outside of Kiev. We got to see uh, quite a bit that day. Um, that's, yeah, that's about all I have on this end, but, uh, but again, thanks for, uh, for, thanks for your support, uh, during the week over. You're welcome. Yeah, thanks. And, um, yeah, thanks for all your efforts. Um, yeah, we'll be writing a, a sort of a short report on that again. Like I say, I'm, I'm always nervous of someone coming to somewhere for five days and then thinking they've got, uh, this sort of deep insight that people who've lived in a place might not have, but, um, we'll definitely be offering just some thoughts on on perspectives and maybe some questions really but yeah we'll certainly share share any report that we we develop um great thanks so yes I want to turn now to uh, uh melina i believe you're with us um who's going to give us an update on some of the work that's going on with the support of the shelter cluster and uh um yeah an update from from your side melina over to you Hi. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, just a few quick updates for things to uh, look out for in the next coming weeks and months. Um, we have the HLP Shelter Toolkit. Um, I'm sure some of you heard about the CCCM HLP Toolkit that we had um, rolled out over the past year, and now this one is more uh, shelter focused. So we're finalizing it and we're hoping to have an initial introduction and consultation by the end of November. Um, so stay tuned for an invitation to that. Um, just like the CCCM toolkit, it's a kind of pulling together all of the HLP resources that are out there, but as they relate to shelter and under different thematic areas related to shelter, like climate change, urban response, women's HLP, um, amongst others. Um, and this one does include more regionally specific um, information because that was some feedback we got from the CCCM HLP toolkit. We also have an update of the HLP um, due diligence standard. So the last time it was updated was 2013 and we will be, um, we're also making some final edits on that and hope to have an initial introduction by the end of November as well. So hoping to send an invitation to, to introduce that. Um, and then we're the fifth HLP e-course module is underway. Um, so this will complement the other four. And this one is focused on HLP climate change, but more focused on protection. Um, and this one will be completed by the end of the year. And then we hope to do a full kind of launch of all of the e-course modules, all five at the beginning of next year. Um, so that's all I have from my side. Thanks, Melina. So um, sounds like lots going on and also opportunities for um, 
colleagues involved in HLP to uh, be part of consultations and to you know try and make sure that the the yeah the the great work you're doing is really relevant and uh, yeah focused on on what what people sort of need and 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 brings in the the latest resources and stuff as well. So yeah, appreciate that and look forward to engaging on that. And um, I'm sure there will be people here who will be uh, very pleased to to be part of that that conversation. So thank you for those updates. Um, thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, so now we have some space. Um, we had uh, we we're going to have a presentation from a colleague who, in the end, it, it didn't happen. So we have a bit more space now to hear from you all. Um, so um, and this sometimes is my favourite part. Um, so it'd be great to hear if people have updates uh, in terms of what they're working on. Um, it could be resources, it could be operational updates, it could be like Clementine shared earlier where um, you know some of the challenges and, and the analysis that's happening around the, the work that's going on. Um, so yeah, I want to offer this 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 time to to hear from you all. And um, yeah, if you'd like to give an update on what you're working on, it doesn't have to be a you know finished shiny project. It can literally be I've started looking at this particular issue, or we're facing this challenge, or we could do with some support on this, or this is what we've been doing. So anything goes. Um, but yeah, I'd like to turn that over to, to you colleagues and uh, see if you have uh, anything you'd like to share with um, yeah with us. Uh, yeah, Fernando, please do come in. Hi, Jim, colleagues. Good afternoon. Uh, I do not have a, a, a presentation uh, either, but I've just been to Honduras and El Salvador for two weeks, uh, visiting the NRC programs and, and, and discussing also with other partners, uh, looking specifically into the housing land and property issues and also a little bit of what our ICLA program in NRC is doing. Like you, after two weeks in a country or in two countries in this case, I cannot claim to be an expert at all, um, but maybe I can share some some reflections of what I saw uh, in that part of the world uh, with colleagues. And of course, if someone in the call is either from uh, that part of the world or or is living there and working there, please, uh, you are all welcome to to contribute and to correct anything that I may say if it is wrong. Um, the two countries, uh, the, the context are very similar in El Salvador and Honduras in many ways, but at the same time, because of recent events in El Salvador uh, with the new uh, policies of the government and the state of exception, things have uh, changed uh, quite a lot. So I'm going to then talk first about Honduras briefly and then uh, turn over to, to El Salvador. I don't know how much people uh, know about, uh, about Central America. It seems to be quite a forgotten uh, uh, both migration and protection crisis, and the epicenter of it is uh, probably happening in Honduras. Uh, while I was there, uh, colleagues were on mission at one of the border crossings, uh, I think with Nicaragua, and they were reporting uh, something between 2,000 to 3,000 people crossing the border uh, per day. Uh, during the week, up to 20, 20 something people then crossing the border with, um, of course, a number of uh, protection uh, issues uh, coming up for those migrants. From But from an HLP perspective, when I ask the question, so where is people staying? A lot of these people is staying in the streets, apparently. I was not able to go and visit the area myself, but that is what one of the NRC um, uh, multidisciplinary teams going there uh, was was uh, telling us. So, so the migration crisis and the HLP consequences, immediate HLP consequences for people is is quite uh, is quite dire. Now there is at the same time in Honduras a rather uh, complicated and deep uh, protection crisis. It is not the type of crisis that we have seen in other uh, as humanitarians that we are familiar with in other places because it is caused primarily. Uh, by gang and uh, drug trafficking related violence uh, that happens you know at an international level because this is a route for for cocaine and other drugs uh, going up to uh, the United States and Europe but also internally in the country where um, 
some of the gangs are also now uh, apparently even producing uh, some of the drugs in country and wanting to control more territory with the obvious consequences that this has for for uh, for HLP. And one of the of the situations that uh, occurs uh, very often is um, threats, extortion uh, that end up with people uh, at risk uh, having to move. Some of them able to reach some programs for uh, international protection, but many of them basically moving from one uh, territory controlled by one gang to maybe a more peaceful place, but often to another uh, part of the country controlled by another gang. So from the frying pan to the fire, as one may may say. In terms of HLP, maybe the good news is that in Honduras, there is uh, recently the, the law on internal displacement has been approved by the government and that includes a provision on abandoned property. The downside of that is that in order to implement the law, uh, it is required to pass a number of bylaws that will be addressing uh, uh, different aspects of the law, including registration of internally displaced persons, but also how is the state going to proceed in order to register abandoned property by those that are registered as IDPs. There are uh, different initiatives in the meantime, some led by UNHCR, NRC is also trying to do different work. Uh, but so far in that, in terms of this abandoned property, um, there is no policy or there is no uh, coordinated effort to see how are we going to, to protect those assets. But that is very much, I mean, there are many other things, but this is in particular one thing that uh, that the community there, the humanitarian community should be should be looking at. And uh, just to remind everyone that in Honduras, uh, in case uh, you don't know, there is a uh, 70% of uh, informal tenure, meaning only 30% of the territory in the country is registered under some of the uh, formal uh, possibilities that the law offers to register uh, property. So this, of course, adds a lot of complication because people move, ends up in some sort of tenure situation that is often um, very uncertain. There is, of course, also a backlog of people that has been moving over the decades, I would say, because of different agrarian reforms that are also in an informality or semi-informality situation because they have not been able to uh, fulfill the entire process to achieve some what in Honduras is called dominio plen, which is like a, a, a full property title. Rather complicated uh, scenario, also the displacement, and maybe I'll finish with that about Honduras. It's quite invisible, uh, internal displacement. The migration is more visible, right? But the internal displacement is rather invisible. Um, there is also situations of confinement where gangs do not allow people to get out of the neighborhoods. Of course, this is um, maybe not so relevant for housing land and property, or maybe it is, but certainly from a protection, general protection perspective, uh, that people is confined in large numbers and are under control of these groups is, is very worrying. And the humanitarian access is also complicated because of security and uh, unlike in other places where negotiations can happen with, um, you know, there is a clear line of command and you know who are you talking to. When it comes to this type of groups in Honduras, it is uh, it is very difficult. So um, that means that we cannot get into communities. Asking the question is uh, about are you displaced, are you threatened is also very difficult. And new techniques for profiling or mapping uh, the internal displacement situation, I think should we should uh, as a uh, as a community try to be uh, brainstorming and come with with ideas that can that can support them to to uh, get over that challenge. So that's for Honduras. I mean, I also have to write a report and my thoughts uh, around many of these is it was uh, complicated, quite, quite, uh, quite a shocking uh, context. El Salvador, as mentioned, um, still many similarities with Honduras, but one big difference is that the state of exception uh, that has been imposed by President Bukele um, uh, has uh, resulted in a visible decrease of violence. Although people in country also say, well, this is temporary, and yet a lot of people have been put in prison, and the gangs are still operating, and it's a quiet for the moment, but it's a ticking bomb. I have no uh, information to say what is true or not. The reality is that somehow the level of violence have, have decreased. A lot of the members of these gangs have moved over to Honduras. And this has created, of course, more space for humanitarian action. 
uh, and, and maybe possibilities to explore also what has happened with that abandoned property that people who were displaced while the gangs were more active and, and how can we find ways of protecting that while people is finding their own way back to to their property right so that there is there is an avenue there to explore the one thing that is, i think is interesting to mention about el salvador those of you that may know a little bit about the region is that there was a civil war in the second half of the 20th century that lasted many years and that ended sometime in the mid 90s uh, however, uh, there is still a lot of people that was displaced by that conflict who are still, I wouldn't say they are displaced in the in a humanitarian sense, but still the HLP aspects of their displacement vis-a-vis -vis durable solutions have not been uh, completely reached. And we did meet quite a lot of people that uh, through different schemes of uh, the various governments uh, after the conflict had been displaced and had ended up uh, uh, living uh, in places that were allocated to them through different reforms and different processes, but never again fulfilled the uh, complete or never managed to complete the entire formalization process of the title. So they are also a little bit in limbo. And then we see situations where, you know, uh, also people that have been living together, non married couples, where the uh, owner of that, not title, but that initial process towards getting a property title is deceased and then the wife and children because they were not married for example are left in a limbo and they don't know if they will be able to access uh, to access that uh, that formalization process which is an interesting um, uh, gender perspective also into hlp um, but i think from a durable solutions perspective that offers an opportunity since we are talking a lot about durable solutions and what is the housing land and property component on that in a place where there is a still sort of, uh, uh, I wouldn't say residual, I think it's a lot of people ended up moving because of that conflict in the last century, but still have not reached a full solution and they're still in a dubious tenure situation, maybe something to explore further from our side to see how could we support uh, them to finally, after so many years, uh, reach, uh, reach a, reaching a solution, let alone the consequences of the organized violence that I've mentioned, and that's also a little bit hidden because of the current state of emergency uh, situation. And I'll finish by saying that none of the HLP AORs are currently, or in none of the countries is the HLP AOR or HLP working groups within the humanitarian coordination activated would be different reasons, and there are different reasons for that. I did meet with uh, with protection cluster colleagues, UNHCR and others that explained, but maybe that's something that we can, a uh, conversation that we could possibly uh, get started as an HLPAOR gym, a call for you and Umbreta, to see if there is something that we can do um, to promote that uh, coordination is important in such a complicated context so that we can at least start trying to think through uh joint strategies for the different actors together with the governments to see if some of these problems can be addressed and i'll stop there if there are questions or especially if someone knows their region better than me wants to also uh, <laughs> contribute because as as uh, as as you jim i mean I, my first time in the area so i cannot claim to be an expert at all in such a complicated process but i leave it at that thank you Thanks, Fernando. Thank you for that uh, really rich, um, yeah, description of, of, of what you were uh, seeing and hearing. And and yes, uh, definitely a conversation to continue about how we can almost advocate for potentially more coordination on HLP and see what's needed. And uh, yeah, and how we might might support that. Um, yeah, if anyone has questions for Fernando or wants to correct him on anything, then please do. Uh, uh, yeah, just either raise your hand or or jump in. Um, Otherwise, if anyone else would like to um, share an update on what they're working on, questions they're facing, um, even just you know points of interest, um, you'd be very, very welcome. I noticed in the chat, I think, Joseph, you were asking about working with um, uh, legal actors and uh, the legal profession, and some people have responded there. I also shared just a report that was written by NRC uh, last year, I believe, on HLP in Honduras as well, in case you're interested um, in that. Um, great. And uh, yeah, Margaret, please do do come in uh, from South Sudan. 
Uh, thank you very much, Jim, for the opportunity. Um, from South Sudan, we just would like to give a bit of updates of what HLP AOR is doing. Uh, first is for all of you to know that um, the Sudan crisis has really brought a lot of, you know, um, it has been um, with a lot of impact in our normal uh, working here in South Sudan because majority, or oh, we've seen an influx of refugees and returnees, South Sudanese returnees coming back from Sudan due to the crisis, and also a lot of Sudanese refugees moving into the country through the different uh, border points. And uh, my, we have worked as a team, uh, most of the humanitarian actors have come in to welcome or to receive the different refugees, returnees in the country and try to take them to the different areas of origin and also to urban settings. So this has actually been an opening, an eye opener to not only the protection cluster, but to the humanitarian sector at large, that HLP is one of the vital aspects that should be taken seriously. And um, with that, we have been able to get more attention, more people have been able to ask us to come in and uh, discuss about HLP rights and how best we can handle HLP issues in the country. So this is one of the most important things that we as HLP AOR in South Sudan are doing is in terms of uh, advocacy. We're advocating for more recognition of HLP rights all through the country. Secondly, is ensuring that all the people, if it is refugees, IDPs and returnees, have that opportunity to get information about their HLP rights, what they can be able to attain. And yeah, then um, the second thing uh, as HLP AOR in South Sudan is that we have been able to have two round table uh, meetings. One is in the capital, Juba, and another one is in Wau, and in a state in northern Barakazal. And just having these two roundtable meetings have brought promotion of dialogue amongst the different stakeholders in uh, the ensuring that HLP rights are uh, adhered to and there's collaboration among uh, different stakeholders. These discussions have focused on various HLP um, aspects such as land tenure systems, the land governance, protection of property rights. So this um, roundtable dialogues um, have facilitated the sharing of experiences where we find government officials openly, you know, pointing fingers at each other, trying to find the best ways to solve the different HLP issues in South Sudan. So this has actually really encouraged and um, provided a platform for stakeholders to voice their concerns and contribute to the development of uh, policies and initiatives related to HLP. Then um, thirdly, is also on the national land uh, policy. This is something that we as HLP AOR actors have been trying to push and for South Sudan, uh, FAO has been taking the lead. It updated us that um, the government has approved this um, national land policy. It has been taken to the cabinet. It is supposed, so now what we are waiting for is an approval so that once that is approved from the, uh, the cabinet, it will be able to be rolled out and it will support in terms of the land um, legal frameworks that are in South Sudan, because what we are using at the moment is the Land Act, which is of 2009. And we are trying to ensure that if this national land policy comes into place, it will help us tackle so many of the HLP issues that we have in the country. So um, that is it. And maybe the last but not least is also the activation of different uh, technical working groups. As HLPAOR South Sudan, we are trying to ensure that the different states, we have 10 states, and we're trying to go state by state, that every state has an active technical working group where in its, con in its context, it can be able to handle the different 
HLP issues that are there. And all we can do is to come in and support in terms of in case they need um, some coordination type of support in terms of policy type uh, support. So what we have done so far is actively engaged one and we are hoping by the end of the year, we will have three active technical working groups to help in ensuring that HLP rights, HLP issues are addressed. So that is basically it from us, HLP AOR South Sudan. Um, yeah, thank you. I, if there's any question or any comments, please, you're most welcome. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you for that update. Um, yeah, uh, any questions or comments, please do. Uh, yeah, ask away for Margaret, for Fernando, for others that have shared. Um, and also, if anyone else would like to um, yeah, give a brief update, please do um, raise your hand or, or come in or make yourself known in some way. Um, Yes, please, and Sophie, please come in. Sorry, not a, not an update as such, but a, a question from a Asia Pacific perspective. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I feel a little bit like Fernando was arguing on the on the on the lack side, as we would say, on the Latin America side, that maybe Asia is a little bit it's far away, <laughs> the Asia Pacific. Um, and I'm sometimes wondering, I mean, we have the HLP AOR in, in, uh, in Afghanistan and we're supporting that. Um, but we don't really see anywhere else. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit of call for coordination. You know, I'm thinking Myanmar, I'm thinking Philippines, Mindanao particularly. Of course, we know your resources are limited, obviously. Um, but we do see a need also for a focus on 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 HLP issues, and on top of the the let's say more permanent conflicts uh, in in the region, um, all of the natural disasters, right? Everything, every natural disaster brings with it HLP issues. But they're very often deprioritized. I mean, I remember raising it with the Pakistan floods last year. Massive HLP issues. Basically, I was told, oh, this is so structural. Don't even go there. Um, so, so yeah, just just wondering about your, and again, and we know your resources are limited, but just your, your reflections in, in that regard. Over. Thanks. Yeah, great question. Um, uh, Ombretta, did you want to respond first and then I'll follow or was this was your hand raised on this yeah, issue? Yeah, no, uh, yeah. yes, actually uh, I, I had um, a question to Fernando and then but this links up really to Anne Sophie's uh, contribution and something that Jim uh, and I um, discussed as well uh, in terms of HLP or coordination. Uh, so, I mean, to put that in order, um, one is, uh, I mean, for Fernando, um, yeah, you say there's no HLP coordination, uh, but being, uh, you know, some of this displacement uh, rooted from events that happened many years ago, surely there is some types of land sector coordination that perhaps we can link better as HLP actors, uh, building on what they've been doing. And then this uh, links to also this question uh, for Asia Pacific. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not sure on all the countries, but I know, for example, um, for Nepal, uh, Nepal, there are um, some types of land sector coordination that were definitely not de 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 defined as HLP coordination that might be existing as well. I mean, for sure in the Philippines, there is something as well uh, that we could 
map a bit better. Uh, and lastly, exactly to come to what the HLP AOR uh, is thinking of doing. I mean, we have and Trezor has really uh, spearheaded this forward to try to consolidate it in an organized way. Obviously, you know, Jim um, and, and, and team has done a lot of work in the past years to to expand HLP uh, coordination and to, you know, to map where is it active, uh, but we have been thinking of mapping complementary coordination processes that perhaps are not HLP per se or not necessarily linked to the to the cluster system where the HLP AOR structure is, is nested, uh, but could still be useful entry point at least to start, uh, you know, connecting a bit the dots and then see where is the need. Is there a need to, for an HLP or, or is there maybe need to input some content and um, maybe knowledge management products or, uh, you know, information into processes that exist that maybe um, have an angle that is different, but maybe are weak, for example, on due diligence or, you know, on some things that have been the strengths of the HLP OR. So def that's definitely, I think, something that we, we see again today, confirmation, Jim, that it's kind of needed and definitely something that is in, in line with the way we would like to see the AOR contributing overall to land tenure security in context of crisis. Thank you, over. <laughs> Thanks, Ombretta. Thanks. Fernando, did you want to uh, respond briefly to, to that? And then I'll, I'll just follow up a little bit on the, the question as well. I can briefly say that I think that there is a very rich institutionality, to call it that way, as it happens in many of the Latin American countries, uh, working on land issues um, and with a fairly OK degree of capacity. There has also been different uh, support by development donors to uh, different agrarian and, and land reforms happening, right? But I did not come across a coordination in within those bodies uh, per se. Um, so I think that that is is lacking. I agree with you, Ombre, that uh, the fact that I mean, one of the reasons why coordination from a humanitarian perspective is not happening is um, it's because there has been a lot of uh, coordination already and there is an overabundance of different groups uh, and I think there is a certain fatigue about that. So I think that as happens at global level and many other levels, there is a, a thinking in this uh, in these countries that okay, before we start new uh, coordination bodies, let's see what is really necessary. And in the meantime, there can be um, probably other types of other ways of coordinating those actors that are interested in working on, on land issues completely. Eventually, if it's not an HLPAOR, but some other, um, uh, but some other mechanism, I still think that they probably would benefit from some degree of support from us at global level to set those in motions. In motion, and a thing that I want to stress is that there is a humanitarian situation in NCA, uh, in, in Central America. So although humanitarian and development crosses over, and we all have heard many times about the Nexus. The situation in these countries, and in particular in Honduras, is dire. It's not, uh, you know, there may be aspects and places and territories where development is the name of the game, but for many it's purely humanitarian because the nature of the violence is, uh, and the displacement is, is not at all um, leaning towards a, a development intervention. The problem, and you know, some of my interlocutors there did put this on the table, is that in order to address the humanitarian consequences in terms of HLP, you need to look at the entire picture in the country. And that brings in development, um, you know, a, a, another long-term approach to land uh, management that makes things even uh, even more complicated. But I, I really want to stress in this forum that the, the situation there, and especially in Honduras, also in El Salvador, but in Honduras especially, is, is, is humanitarian at, at, its, uh, at its core. I don't know if I'm answering you, Ombreta. I look a bit a skeptic, but uh, happy to, to continue the conversation. Thanks, Fernando. And yeah, and Sophie, just before I come back to you, just to say briefly on, um, on Asia Pacific, yeah, Myanmar, Philippines, 
and um, you know we've we've had conversations over the years with Myanmar about what's possible around HLP coordination and how best to try and support and uh, yeah I mean it's a good prompt for me to follow up on that again because there was a time where um, there was something maybe happening but there was also a strong um, sort of national um, focus on on that as well and 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 we decided to not try and create something extra but obviously things have changed there in the last year or so and I think there could be more um, yeah something more proactive on that um, so I, yeah I mean I've had quite open <laughs> conversations with colleagues there about about what would it look like to, to do HLP coordination now I think partly because it is such a controversial subject as well which sometimes people don't want to be too visible on it so that's something we've seen in other contexts as well on Philippines yeah I've worked with certainly the protection colleagues there and, and we've done some training with them um, and also with the protection cluster um, to kind of look at HLP issues but again it hasn't become a, a sort of its own coordination body partly because I think it's about identifying who would be the actors who would lead on that I mean it still tends to be where there is a, an NRC or or you know Habitat or, or someone similar that is able to take the lead on that role so that's sometimes a constraint that um, be great to hear your um, thoughts because there might be other actors that we don't know right so um, that's often the case um, yeah and Pakistan as well there was had a number of calls on HLP issues and I know another a number of colleagues did as well but again that the question of whether or not it needed the coordination I think we're always a bit wary of not wanting to create coordination just because at the same time it's trying to understand what's needed and and I think on this sort of wider nexus question is that also you know nexus does include humanitarian so we need to always make sure we can you know try and be present for those conversations where there's a particular humanitarian angle that still needs emphasizing um but yeah that's a couple of thoughts but please over to you Ken. no no I, I I fully understand and and actually I guess my argument is more that Again, limited resources, you know, there are cases where this should be taken up by the be it protection cluster, protection working group, whatever we call it in, in, in the system, right? The importance is that these are issues that are not forgotten. And, and, and I think I think that that is really my whole point. Uh, and that goes as well for the natural disasters. Um well, yeah, these, then people say, oh, but it's development. Yeah, but it's not only development, right? And and mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you look at Myanmar, the, I think the magnitude of people who have left Myanmar is much larger than we think. Well, I know it is because I'm hearing the numbers in the countries around Thailand, in Thailand and around Thailand, which means, again, we're talking about enormous amount of, of abandoned properties that we're not aware about. So where is this going? So it's just to, to sort of say, OK, this is... Uh, yeah, this is bigger than we think it is. I mean, I was I was in Indonesia and Malaysia the last couple of weeks. There are unconfirmed reports, but reports of 82,000 Burmese, not Rohingya, but Burmese having arrived in, in Malaysia over the past, since the coup in 21. Mm -hmm. These are presumably people who have left behind properties because they are and not and valuable properties because they are doctors, nurses, teachers, mm. all of the the civil defense movement, right? So there will be, we know there yeah. will be issues in the future. Mm -hmm. So so it's more to to I guess I'm advocating here <laughs> for my mm. region as well. Yeah. Um where I feel that sometimes the HLP issues are not really at the forefront, like I've seen it elsewhere. Ukraine, yes, it's always been at the forefront, the HLP mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. uh, but here it's not, not at all. Mm -hmm. Over. Thanks. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think, yeah, highlights the importance of 
keeping an eye out, like keeping our eyes on what is happening, even if there's not an obvious response, you know, that we can be part of. And I know when talking with colleagues in Myanmar, it, it, the work has been about, well, how can we start creating ways of trying to document what's happening? I mean, and that's the extent to, you know, can you start trying to prepare for a time where maybe we can uh, address some of these issues? But yeah, thank you. That's a really, yeah, point well, well noted. Um, we have just a few minutes, but Ludmilla, I see you there. Please do uh, come in. Thank you. I think that the issue of climate change and displacement is someone that I could talk about for hours, but I'm going to spare you all, not only because of time constraints, but because we wouldn't have the patience. I think that climate change is already climate change, including the natural disasters, is already displacing an awful lot of people. Climate change is a direct driver of displacement per se and is a threat multiplier. And yet, a lot of organizations are failing to incorporate climate change in its planning, in its working. So we, if we work with HLP specifically, without considering climate change and everything that it is causing, we are going to dry eyes. We are going to keep dry eyes and just working on the consequences. So I think it's really, really very, very important because climate change alone is not only displacing people and multiplying the threats, it's multiplying the amount of people that need and will need humanitarian aid. So it's really, really important that those who are not considered it, moreover for the lack of resources that Anne-Marie is pointing out, we need to coordinate and to integrate all the issues and aspects that can affect this work. So thank you so much. Over to you, Jean. Yeah, thanks, Lamilla. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, I think it's something we're all sort of trying to catch up on a little bit, isn't it? Um, the impacts that climate change has. I shared just briefly there the the report and the event that we held around HLP and um, climate change you know, a, a couple of months ago. Um, because I think we're all trying to understand what are the implications and, you know, that more people now are displaced from uh, climate change related uh, things than, than conflict. And, and, and what does that mean? And what does that mean for our work, I think, is a, yeah, a real issue. Um, and interesting to hear that, um, as Melina mentioned, there's some training being developed around HLP and climate change as well by, um, but yeah, by others. So, um, yeah, I think it's a, a, a thing we need to keep looking at and um, trying to learn from and, and make better connections with those who are working on these kind of issues as well. Again, another call for a different kind of nexus in a way. Um, do we want two nexus, nexi? I'm not sure, but um, maybe there's a, there's another one there. Um, gosh, yes, triple nexus could mean three lots of nexuses. Anyway, that sounds like a good place to stop. Um, thank you, everyone, for your uh, inputs and your participation. Um, did anyone have any yeah, final words or comments on Bretta? Thanks, Jim. Um, not really. I just wanted to say, uh, you know, IOM, and that could be something maybe we discuss or we bring in somebody from IOM side or IOM colleagues who are aware of it are, you know, putting in place a tracking matrix uh, for climate induced displacement. Uh, because actually, um, uh, you know, different organizations count different things when it comes to displacement. We know that, uh, I mean, counting is important. Um, we also know that counting is not all. I mean, at the end, um, uh, you know, there will be always complexities in how we count people, uh, but it does, uh, um, you know, we start to have from different side, the World Bank, IOM, um, uh, you know, different uh, uh, monitoring mechanisms, um, you know, numbers that kind of really point exactly to the urgency and the magnitude. You know, we always thought, you know, conflict is the driver, first driver of um, HLP violations, while it's getting quite clear 
that uh, that this is not the case. And um, you know, myself, I was, for example, looking at and putting together our data just on the number of people that are going to be displaced by sea level rise, and uh, this is going to be depending. I mean, actually, um, there is a UN body that has been calculating exactly how much is it depending on the three scenario on 1.5 degree, 2 degree, and 4 degree increase by the end of the century, and it goes to like 400 million people being displaced just by sea level rise. Um, so, so that's very well noted, and I think uh, you know uh, Jim put in the in the chat uh, a briefing that was done on this, but definitely we are looking at as well in the OR as at you know strengthening the stream of work and thinking and evidence uh, in the work of the AOR. Uh, so thank you very much everybody for your contributions. It was a pleasure to see you all, all of you. Thanks a lot Jim for sharing and uh, have yeah. a good evening and afternoon. And see you at the end of October for the uh, Protection Forum event. Yes, look forward to it. But thanks everyone. Oh and if you can put your cameras on to wave, that's always nice. Thank you, so thank you so much. Goodbye. Bye. 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 <laughs> bye, bye. bye have a great day evening. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Cheers.